All right, well, look, we might um, get the housekeeping underway and any of the, anyone who's turning up a little later will um, will join shortly. Uh, so my name's Philip. I manage the digital media at the Royal Australian Historical Society, and I'll be assisting with the technical side of things today. So I ask that during the duration of the talk, please stay muted um, so that way we don't interrupt the speaker. There will be an opportunity at the end for questions. So if you have any questions or comments, put them into the chat bar and we will come to those at the end. Um, and if you think of anything during the talk, put them in early because then we'll have something to work with at the end. So uh, it's about two minutes past one. And so I'm going to hand over to the Royal Australian Historical Society Senior Vice President, Christine Yates, who will introduce our speaker for today and uh, introduce the topic for today's talk. Over to you, Christine. Thanks very much, Philip. And hello and welcome to everyone. I will begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. All different lands, I realise that, right across Australia and someone in Mexico. Um, I'm on the land of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to elders past and present, acknowledge that it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So today we are in for a rare treat because Chris Maxworthy is a most extraordinary scholar because he reads the Spanish archives in Spanish and that provides him with an immense insight, the sort of thing which I just dream about. Um, today he is going to expand on his research in the Spanish language archives of the Americas and Spain and he's going to talk to us about all those people who escaped from Sydney convicts and others, not just convicts, and um, how they escaped um, to the Americas, Mexico, Panama, Peru, etc. Um, and he's going to look at particular ships and, uh, and individuals, have some case studies, which is always, which is always great. And to introduce um, Chris, who is um, a former colleague on the RAHS Council, um, he served as a councillor some years ago, um, he is an engineering officer with the Royal Australian Navy, a graduate of the RAN College, RAN College, I should say, at uh, Jarvis Bay and the University of New South Wales. And he has degrees in both electrical engineering and history, BA in history. Um, his historical research has been of the early colonial maritime history of Australia and the Spanish rivalry that occurred once the English had established Botany Bay. And we're going to hear about all these imperial rivalries across the Pacific. Uh, now, Chris is also a, a Winston Churchill Fellow, which was awarded in 2011 to advance his research across Spanish language archives for the early history of Australia. And he has, in fact, written and spoken quite widely on, on this research. Um, it turned up valuable prize court records dealing with both British and Spanish privateers and the Spanish plan of 1796 to escape, sorry, to escape, to attack Sydney and uh, patriate the personnel to South America. Ah, what an amazing story that would have been. Please join me across wherever we are, across our lands in welcoming Chris Maxworthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, and yeah, the audio is working for me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I'm very, very fond of the Royal Australian Historical Society. Uh, if I could put on a plug uh, for those of you that might have joined as a result of hearing about it on the ABC, uh, then please do consider joining the Royal Australian Historical Society. It's a, a great institution. Uh, once the buildings, uh, the construction is finished in Macquarie Street or the renovations, uh, it'll be an even better facility and the uh, the staff are always helpful and uh, I've, uh, I've been very grateful for their research assistance. Okay, so we're going to discuss the unknown routes from Port Jackson to the Spanish Americas. I'm really focusing on the period from initial settlement through to 1820. 1820 corresponds to the end of uh, Lock Governor Lachlan Macquarie's um, period as um, governor of New South Wales, a 10 year period. And also it, it represents probably a big change uh, from the uh, epoch of uh, war between the European powers to a settling in phase. And that settling in phase went on for 
uh, a lot you know, for most of the century and um, up until the commencement of World War I. Right, so let's look at uh, what I'm covering. So um, from this presentation, I'm hoping to provide you with new insights uh, into colonial New South Wales from the other side, from the Spanish colony of the Americas. In other words, we, when we do research, often the, the historical record is very much one that is um, uh, composed by the British, uh, British administrative records. But the fascinating thing is that the Spanish who were acute observers of um, what was going on in New South Wales, they had a different perspective. And a lot of their perspective was based upon their previous experiences when the British uh, were in the Caribbean and what that led to and the code of or the style of um, development that the British undertook. Uh, next point here is my research was in the Span Spanish language archives uh, in the Americas and Spain. And, uh, and for that, I'm eternally grateful to the Churchill Trust. They allowed me to uh, spend, uh, they, they afforded me the opportunity to do eight weeks of um, travel and uh, readings in archives in uh, Spain and Mexico, uh, in Chile, Colombia, uh, Peru, and, um, and then subsequently I visited other archives such as those in Argentina and, um, and uh, Uruguay. Okay, what the data shows is that there were convicts, soldiers, mariners, stowaways, um, either legal or illicit, that traveled by sea and turned up in the Spanish Americas. And shortly we'll show those locations and discuss a bit about that. Um, additionally, there were shipwreck crews and deserters that also appeared in the Spanish Americas. Um, often those um, ships were part of what was providing support to the colony at New South Wales. And what occurred was that um, some misadventure during the voyaging and hey presto, uh, people are marooned on islands in the Pacific and trying to find their way back. They didn't necessarily all turn up in Sydney. Um, later during the European wars, um, we find mariners were captured, particularly people that were crews of whalers and they were made prisoners of war for the duration of the wars. And if you think about it, the, those wars started after the French Revolution or during the French Revolution, uh, after the execution of um, the Royal Family of France uh, by 1796, uh, having been an ally to Britain prior to that period, by 1796, Spain had joined with France in waging war against England and um, the alliance partners. And then finally, this presentation is a sample. I don't um, intend that it be thought of as being comprehensive, um, but it does discuss the process of how many of these mariners or soldiers or ex-convicts found their way back. Okay, so here's, oh, oh God, what's happened there? No, we need to get back. Let's try that. Okay, sorry about that. All right, what we have here is an early map. This is from the 16th century and represents the nature of the Spanish colonies, the new world, um, as it was originally termed, and also the Sea of the South. So if I, if you can see my mouse here, this whole region was known as the Sea of the South. And it was known by that name because when Balboa uh, traveled across here, the Panama, the Isthmus of Panama, which was then known as the Isthmus of Darien, uh, that, in, and the year was uh, 1513, he saw a sea all to the south that he, that he knew to be a new sea, not, not the Atlantic that he traveled from. Um, what we also see here is that there were many, many locations throughout the Americas. Um, on the Pacific coast that were populated by the Spanish. And uh, despite what Hollywood might present um, and the idea that it was conquistadors murdering and plundering for um, gold and silver, in reality, most of the settlement, um, settlements that occurred was a process of spreading the religion of propagating the faith, the Roman Catholic faith. And uh, so many, many of these locations were in fact missions and, uh, and not at all in the model of the uh, conquistadors. Though the early period of um, conquest, uh, which the English grabbed with both hands and used called the, uh, has come to be known as the black legend. But we might uh, move through that. 
Okay, a quick plug whilst I may. Um, last year, uh, 2022, that was the 500th anniversary of the circumnavigation of the world. Okay, um, initially commenced by um, Ferdinand Magellan. Uh, he's a representation of the voyage outbound in red, which shows the process he traveled in order to find or discover the Magellan Straits, the voyage across the ocean of the South, the Sea of the South, which he named the Pacific Ocean. And he named it for the Pacific Ocean because during the three months that he voyaged from Cape Horn all the, across the Marianas here, there was no storm or tempest. So he thought it a very unique ocean. Um, he then, um, they discovered the Philippines or the Europeans um, discovered from their point of view, the Philippines. Um, and Magellan got involved in some local intrigues. And as a result of that, he perished. And El Cano was the man that took what was left of it had originally been a four ship flotilla. It was just really one ship that sailed all the way back. That's the blue line down around Cape, uh, Cape of Good Hope and landed in um, uh, Cadiz, I think. Anyway, la landed in Spain some uh, three and a half years later. And that was the first circumnavigation of the world. So that was 500 years ago. So we often, having come from an Anglo-centric uh, history, uh, tend to overlook what might have been, what was achieved by the Spanish and which was in some ways um, rubbed out in the process of the English setting the scene. Okay, so the Spanish before settlement in, uh, at Botany Bay in 1788. Okay, so Spain was the first European power to discover the uh, Pacific Ocean. That was 1513, Nunez Balboa, followed by Ferdinand Magellan and uh, Sebastian Elcano, as we've just spoken about. So really by 1788, when Arthur Phillips arrived in Sydney, the, uh, the region of the New World and the Pacific Coast had been um, colonized for more than 300 years, three centuries. And we don't often appreciate that. Uh, I know when I first embarked on this research, I had very little idea about uh, Spanish history, but uh, as you read it and come to know it, it's a fascinating phase. Okay, it's, and also the Spanish were intent on discovering the Great Southland. It's just that the funds or the motivation sort of ran out during the 17th century. Okay, so the Spanish lake or you know, the terminology for the Pacific, really when you think about it is bounded by the Spanish Americas in the East. That's what we think of today as you know, modern California, and Oregon, all the way down through the Central American countries down to uh, Peru and Chile, and around the corner, around Cape Horn, to uh, uh, the, uh, the modern-day countries of Argentina and Uruguay and Paraguay. Okay, the thing that motivated, the thing that kept everything going at this point was the China trade. Um, back then, for several centuries, China was the source of the valuable items, silks, um, herbs, tea. Tea could only be found in China until the British uh, chap called Fortune stole tea plants and got them planted in Ceylon and parts of India. And that shifted the dynamics there in terms of trade. Um, other aspects, the, the counter to the Chinese trade was the silver that was produced in the Americas, um, mainly in Mexico and Peru, which was then transshipped across into the Philippines to be then traded with the Chinese for their goods. Okay, and throughout the whole Pacific, the only Spanish Navy presence was at Callao. Callao is a port in Peru, uh, very close, about 30 kilometers from the city of Lima. Um, back in this period, the process of discovery entitled nations under the law of nations and entitled the discoverer the opportunity to do both colonize and extract resources and to defend. And so as a result of Magellan's discoveries, the whole of the Pacific was claimed by Spain as its own sovereign territory and that the oceans were closed to foreigners. Okay, moving along. That's a quick summary of, and, and now we have a map. Uh, uh, here's a chart. So effectively we have two hemispheres. Um, as a result of Columbus's discovery uh, and earlier claims by Portugal, the whole region in the middle here was territory that was claimed by Portugal as its own and announced by several treaties and endorsed by the Roman Catholic Pope. 
okay? And then the area outside of this hemisphere, that was the other half, and that was the area that belonged to the Spanish. So the deal was that the Portuguese were permitted to sail east in order to access their colonies in India and the Spice Islands, whereas for the Spanish, they were required to sail west. And as a result of this treaty line, the country of Brazil became Portugal's because it cut through and um, effectively it was there that uh, we have uh, the first major colony in the Americas by Portugal, not by dint of discovery, but by dint of treaty. And the reason that it extends um, further along here is really just the nature of the Amazon basin and, the, um, and, and that aspect. Okay, now we get to, I'm just gonna move this around so I can cope. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so the Spanish America in, in 1790, so within two years of the settlement at, um, um, at Sydney, at Port Jackson, you can see this is, this is a map showing the regions that were the uh, vice royalties that Spain controlled. So to the north here, this Mexico region, okay. New Granada, Nueva Granada was the Central American region. Okay, Peru was the majority of the coast of the south and also encompassed Chile. And then down here was the um, the very uh, the vice the vice royalty of um, Rio de la Plata. It was a late addition. It was effectively only created in 1776 as a major administrative region, and a lot of that was simply that it had grown very quickly because it was a major route for smuggling and uh, the Spanish authorities were looking for some control. Uh, separately, we also have the Captaincies General. So these are places like Chile and Panama and Guatemala. And that effectively, if I just move to the next slide, you'll get it in position. Okay, we then have, as a result of that, key locations. So Nootka, Nootka Sound is effectively Van in modern day Vancouver Island, is a region that became very important in the 1790s, uh, Spain almost went to war with Britain over the fact that it was access to um, uh, sea otter pelts. So sea otter pelts were highly valued in China. And so therefore, from a, a strategic trade point of view, uh, both the Spanish and the British were fighting it out. And that's the reason why George Vancouver in the early 90s was sent up to this region in order to uh, settle the peace. He was the commissioner for boundaries and territory. Um, so his job was to negotiate with his counterpart who was representing Spain in order to come up with a process where both sides didn't have to go to war and they could conclude a treaty. And that was the Nootka Convention. Similarly down here in San Blas, that was the naval presence, the naval department, and that will feature prominently in terms of convicts escaping. Panama similarly features, it's a very short, it's a very um, abbreviated piece of land between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. And this becomes an important point for uh, uh, persons to um, transship themselves in order to get home. Okay, Callao, okay, uh, I didn't put that on, so my apologies. Callao is effectively um, here adjoining Lima. And this is the location for the, um, uh, the Spanish Navy presence in the Pacific, all, all aspects, particularly control of the trade across to the Philippines, because uh, we've all heard of the Manila galleons. That was a regular routing of trade between Mexico and, um, and the Philippines in order to exchange goods from China. Okay, Coquimbo, Coquimbo um, is effectively a remote area of Chile where a lot of uh, contraband trade was conducted. And then you've got Valparaiso here and Buenos Aires on the other side. Okay, so let's do a little of an, an example. So the earliest examples we have of um, English transshipping themselves across uh, to the Atlantic in order to get home. In 1792, we have um, Captain Matthew Weatherhead. He was shipwrecked in the Pacific Islands. Uh, he and his crew basically some went to Tahiti, some were picked up from Tahiti, others perished, but um, the Matilda, uh, with the loss of the Matilda, uh, Weatherhead and a few of his crew basically were picked up by Vancouver's ships and carted up to um, Vancouver Island. From there, they joined with um, 
the commander of uh, HMS Chatham, uh, that's William Robert Broughton, and they were escorted down to San Blas and from San Blas made their way across to Veracruz, which was the major port on the Atlantic coast, and then home. From a Sydney convict perspective, Thomas Muir. So Thomas Muir was a Scot who was convicted of sedition and arrived in the colony in about 1793. Okay, so he um, transacted a deal. Um, there was the, the Captain Ebenezer Dorr, who was in charge of the Whaler Otter, had called at Sydney uh, through some subterfuges and a bit of transacting or whatever. We find that um, uh, Thomas Muir stowed himself away on the Otter. It left Sydney, sailed across, and they landed, um, they eventually landed uh, Muir on the coast of uh, Mexico at San Blas. And after much to do, the, the Viceroy of Spain, of New Spain, sorry, uh, at, in Mexico City, basically agreed to him being transshipped across. Those were the earliest instances. Now, the question is why, why were the Spanish so close to foreigners? And the, and the key part was trade. The, the Spanish regarded the Pacific as their own territory. They also had large investments in terms of silver that was being generated in Mexico and Peru. And the carting of those goods occurred on the, the King's Royal Highway, the Camino Real. And these were mule trains. So it, I found it fascinating when I was read, doing some reading, there are hundreds and thousands of mules and muleteers called um, Ari, Arios, Los Arios. They were the source of transshipping goods, um, whether it be goods that were Chinese goods arriving on the coast of Mexico, the Pacific coast of Mexico, all the way across to Veracruz to be shipped back to Spain. And similarly, silver followed that route as well from the mines in uh, Zacatitas. Okay, so that's, you know, it was one of self-preservation, the less that the enemy knew about how Spain conducted its business and its colonies, the better. Okay, now in 1801, we come to the situation of the fortune. Now, this one I found fascinating because this um, is a whole lot of material in terms of names of people that have come from Sydney as stowaways. So in summary, the, the fortune was a privateer commanded by Sinclair Halcrow, who, who was a Scot. It was a large vessel, it was at 500 tonnes. So 500 tonnes is about twice the displacement of what a, a whaler would be in um, in most of the whalers in the South Seas trade, had uh, 22 cannons, had a crew of 90. It had sailed from Cape Town, which is where it had been captured, and it was on its way, um, and it its sole purpose was to cruise for prizes against Spain. So um, it was a privateer, but it was a well-stocked privateer, and when it called it Sydney, it collected a further 34 crew to make up a total of 124. But what uh, Hal Crow allegedly didn't know about is that he had um, 13, or sorry, 19 starways and 13 of those escaped from, um, from him at St. Mary's Island. And, um, and it, it's fascinating. I, um, uh, when I read, you know, I read up on the fortune and I found in the records that um, uh, in, in June of that year, in June um, uh, of 1802, I think, yeah, Okay, so what, what, what Sinclair Halcrow did is he had to write to Governor King and apologise and explain. And he basically said, look, after, I, after I'd left your colony, you know, um, and after your people had inspected my ship, I was three days out and um, I started to see strange faces on deck. And um, anyway, I called the hands and I basically mustered everyone and I turned, I turned out there were 19 had found means to get on board and stow themselves away which men were immediately put in irons and put on prisoners' rations. I found they were sickly from confinement and later I was obliged to release them for the benefit of their health. At St. Mary's Island, which is in, um, on the coast of Chile, while my privateer was wooding and watering, I was taking on um, provisions, uh, the greater part of the prisoners escaped. And then at Rio de Janeiro later, uh, the remainder, the remaining six, even though they were guarded um, they basically uh, grabbed a guard boat and, well, sorry, no, they swam ashore. Okay, so the, and let's just look at the Spanish record. 
Okay, so what we have here is we have the, the deal that Spain negotiated, or England, sorry, Britain negotiated with um, Spain was that any mariner that was um, taken prisoner, uh, no matter where, but if they were taken prisoner by Spain, the British would reimburse the, um, the Spanish for uh, at the rate of two reals or uh, effectively a quarter of a peso per day. Okay, so what we're looking at here I'll just click so we can bring up the names. Okay, there are the names highlighted. And for each man is the, the number of pesos that apply um, for repayment for the period of time that they were held by the Spanish. So in the case of Michael Maggs, he was held from the 2nd of December 1801, okay, until the following April. So 16 pesos needed to be recompensed to the Spanish for him. Uh, similarly, the next guy, Thomas, now it's hard to read his name. The, the thing to remember is that a B in Spanish can also be a V. So it could be Lowther, okay? 15 pesos in his case, Patrick Mc something, McAmir, okay? Uh, 15 pesos. And similarly, if you're trying to decode when you read the um, to the right there, idem is ditto, okay? So it's idem, you know, it's ditto and ditto. And then uh, we have numbers written out um, beside the names and then the numerals accompanying those. Okay, so now let's go to the next. Okay, so this has been my process. I, I haven't spent a lot of time on this, but I found it interesting enough to explore, okay, well, who might these people have been? So uh, if it's in square brackets, I'm only guessing. Uh, in the, so if we look at the, third, the fourth person down, William Peacock, Okay, he was convicted in 1792, seven years transportation and arrived in the Royal Admiral. Okay, for the next guy, Samuel Biabi, could be Samuel Pillaway. Uh, often in looking at names, I worked on the basis of their first name uh, because people, if they were trying to conceal their identity, would often change their second name. Okay, the, the next guy is an interesting one, Thomas. Okay, what the Spanish wrote as Camboitidia. Okay, um, turns out, I think, to be Thomas Cumberledge. He was of the New South Wales Corps. He was discharged in 1797. Okay, and a few years earlier, he'd been granted land at um, York Place. Now, the interesting thing about this guy is that uh, if you look at the court records, uh, the civil records, he always seemed to be chased for um, debts. So it, it's likely that in his case, he sought to escape from Sydney because life was getting too hard for him and it was easier to escape your debts and start afresh somewhere. Okay, the next name in that group was William, well, the Spanish writer was Hasseton, but uh, in reality, reality, I'm guessing that it's William Hatherton, who again was a convict sentenced in 1790, seven years transportation and came out on the Britannia. Okay, so that's the first part. We now go to the second part of the Fortune's Deserters. Okay, so we've got additional, oh, I'll, I'll, just to speed things up a bit. Here are the new names here. We have uh, William, so most likely William, and could be Bottom. George could be Needham. Next one could be Adam Clark. Okay, and uh, Watto Poise, Samuel Uton. The thing to be aware of in Spanish is that the H is silent. So, and we'll see that in a moment when we go to the potential names. Okay, William Bowton. That was a hard one. I couldn't find anybody of that name. So I'm hoping to uh, link up with the Society of Australian Genealogists and ha have them make my life a bit easier in terms of who these people might be. George Needham. Okay, well, there was no George Needham, but there are Sorry, go back. There was no George Neum, but there was a Thomas who arrived on the pit. Adam Clark, pretty easy to identify, you know, March 1799, sentenced to seven years. Now, of the convicts, he's the first that you, I can point to that says, okay, well, he hadn't served his sentence at the time he departed the colony. So the, the deal was um, under English law, if anybody reappeared in the United Kingdom, um, having not completed their sentence of transportation, then the, uh, the sentence was death. The, the punishment, the nominal punishment was death. 
um, and some might recall from Great Expectations by Dickens. We have um, uh, young Pip's uh, benefactor, basically being a, a convict that had escaped and blah, blah, blah. So it, it did happen. Okay, um, and those records are in the old Bailey to uh, check. Uh, Walter Point, Pouse, could be Walton Rouse, uh, tried in the old Bailey in 1783, and he was well and truly a time expired convict. And uh, Samuel Oton is Samuel Houghton, and he'd arrived in the Atlantic in 1791. As to uh, Robert Powney, can't, haven't had any luck. Again, something maybe for the Society of Australian Genealogists. Okay, so now let's just look at the roots home. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, in the case of the deserters from the fortune, they were take they were held so chilly that the island was well, sorry the location of um, Saint Mary's Island is roughly around here, several hundred kilometers to the south of Valparaiso. Okay, uh, there's a, the nearest port city there is Talcahuano, and Talcahuano was a it would have a governor, sorry a governor by our term. In reality, like a, a, a local councillor, town, town mayor, okay, and they would basically, they hosted those individuals at the location in Talcahuano for that period of time, and it was they that were seeking restitution of the funds that they'd expended. Then, uh, so from Talcahuano, those, those mariners were taken to Lima, okay, after having lingered down there for a while. And, and as you can imagine, there'd be um, the process of administrative, uh, the bureaucracy of, no, I don't want them, you have them, you look after them. Oh, the war's almost finished, you know, just stick with them, that type of thing. So from Lima, they basically then were held and they were shipped to oh, by sea to Panama. Okay, and the process of getting from, Pan from Panama City, which is on the Pacific coast, to the, um, the smallish town of Portobello. It's a land crossing and it could typically be achieved in less than five days. Um, if you're in a hurry, you can do it in two, uh, but typically uh, it was walk part and then uh, there were uh, barges that would take you down the river. Okay. Uh, now, once during times of war, what would happen is English mariners uh, from Portobello would be shipped to Port Royal in Jamaica. That was the nearest location of a British presence. And from there, they would be um, usually impounded, impressed by the British uh, to become mariners in, or, or to serve in one of Her Majesty's warships. Okay, just click on the next. All right, the next homeward route is uh, San Blas to Veracruz. We spoke about this uh, slightly earlier. Um, for instance, um, the shipwrecked master of the, um, of the Matilda and his Royal Navy counterpart. Okay, so to get from San, San Blas is really a small location. Um, I've been there, it's, it's a tourist town now, it's a lovely location. It does have a lot of mosquitoes and um, sand flies and so on, but uh, lovely location. Back then, nobody really wanted to live in San Blas because it was so infected with uh, insects. So typically even the naval officers in charge of the naval department there, lived up the road in Tepic, which was about 70 kilometers. Uh, it was up into the highlands because for those of you that don't know, Mexico is effectively a, um, it's more a plateau. It's a raised plateau uh, that then drops down to the coast on either side. And so therefore uh, one can lead a pleasant temperate life um, on the plateau, such as places like Tepic, whereas down on the coast, places like San Blas, not very pleasant. Um, and particularly in, in that era of no air conditioning and no insect repellents. Okay, so uh, the typical transit from San Blas to Veracruz on the Atlantic coast, um, you're looking at somewhere around a couple of months in order to make it across. Um, if you're lucky, you might be able to um, ride one of the pack animals in order to do less walking. Um, otherwise, it was propelled under your own steam and usually with a military escort. Again, the Spanish were reluctant to allow uh, foreign visitors to see what was going on as to their commerce in Mexico. 
okay? Um, at Veracruz, typically um, prisoners, English mariners would be held there until a cartel ship, in other words, a ship that would come from Jamaica bringing Spanish prisoners of war and would exchange them for any English that might be there. The Spanish and the English had a very formalized and well-run process of exchanging prisoners. Whereas once Napoleon came on the scene in France, that all went out the door and um, it was much more um, cutthroat. Okay, um, now, next slide. Okay, the, um, the, in 1806, the Venus. Okay, so the Venus was a, a ship that was captained by a Nantucketer, a New Englander called Samuel Chase. And it sailed from Sydney for Tasmania to resupply Port Dalrymple. Port Dalrymple was the early colony uh, on the north of Tasmania, on the Tamar River, and around the location of what is now known as Georgetown in um, Tasmania. Okay, so while Captain Chase was ashore, okay, the mate Benjamin Kelly, who was an American as well, seized the ship with some crew and they, uh, they effectively had a mutiny and they piratically seized the ship and they sailed it to New Zealand, taking with them several female convicts um, and those, a couple of the crew that were prepared to sail with them. The other, the other ones of the crew had been landed um, in a boat um, in Tasmania, those that didn't want to participate in the, uh, the piracy. Okay, rumours pointed to the Venus being seized by Maoris, uh, that the crew um, and passengers were killed and eaten. Uh, in truth, the ship took on some Maoris and then sailed for South America. So about a year later, a year after the, uh, the mutiny in Tasmania, the Venus turns up with a cock and bull story in, um, in Chile about how they were an American ship and they'd been, you know, they'd had a hard time in storms and been blown off course and so on. And so therefore uh, they landed in Chile and, um, and Kelly uh, attempted to sell his ship, the Venus, uh, to the Chileans and to then make his way back. Um, but then the story started, started to fall apart as different members of the crew and the women were interviewed. And so therefore um, Kelly made a hasty retreat and uh, escaped. Um, and it's interesting because around the same time, the English were looking for George Bass. So George Bass had sailed from Sydney in about 1804 in a, a ship also called the Venus. And in the Spanish records, you come across these things where eventually the Spanish are being written to by the British saying, look, you know, we're looking for the Venus. Have you seen it? Do you have any record? Could you ask your people? And so all throughout um, the Americas are uh, turning up letters where each of the respective viceroys or governors are discussing that, look, you know, we've looked for George Bass. No, we haven't, we haven't found him, but we did find this other Venus here and this guy, Kelly, and maybe this is yours. And so anyway, the, the case of the Venus and Kelly, it's an interesting one because it's certainly a massive undertaking to sail and voyage all the way from Tasmania across to the coast of Chile and to um, arrive in one piece, particularly given that um, None of the, apart from Kelly as the mate, no one else on board really was a seasoned mariner. And it was certainly a voyage that um, would have taken perhaps through island hopping a period of about eight months. All right. Okay, and the last one I'm gonna feature here is the hero. So the hero of London was a privateer. It'd been trading contraband on the coast of Mexico and Chile. Uh, typically, what you had is English fabrics being exchanged for colonial silks. Okay, so um, the hero suffered its first loss when um, uh, attempting to do a trade on near San Blas, uh, the longboat was seized. The, the hero was pretending to be an American ship. And, um, and what happened was that two of the crew landed and basically went to the local governor saying, look, we want to be, um, we're seeking political asylum with you. We don't want to be with the ship. We'd like to become Catholics and live here. And, you know, hey, let us tell you about the ship. And what they said was, look, you know, even though it's pretending to have papers from the United States, it's British, it's got contraband. And so that led to the seizing of about half the crew. So then Captain Gardner, the master of the hero, sailed for Tahiti. And then from there on to Sydney, trying to gain more crew. And at Sydney, he was able to sign on about another 15 people as crew. And one of those was uh, Henry Evans Williams, who had been a uh, purser on an East India Company ship 
called the Taunton Castle. That ship had sailed up past Norfolk Island and called it Norfolk Island. And whilst there, he basically discharged himself from the ship and basically then became the Assistant Surveyor General in New South Wales for a period of time uh, before finding that, no, he didn't really want to hang around here and he wanted to get back to England. So um, he basically joined the hero, but it was a bad choice because the hero, um, having sailed back to uh, northern Chile, was captured at Coquimbo. Uh, the crew were held captive. Uh, a Spanish Admiralty Court was convened. And for me, from a historical point of view, the most fascinating thing is we have a 120-page document written in Spanish that details the proceedings of that court, where the witnesses are called. So uh, the court called a total of about um, 15 witnesses. They each had to give their story. And in that is the biographical information of each individual. You know, this guy was a, had been in Sydney. You know, he wanted to get out of there, but there were so few ships calling that the hero was the first reliable chance he had. And here he goes. So what we find is that by April of 1809, Captain Gardner plus um, Henry Evans Williams and also Gardner's son, or what I think is Gardner's son, who was a native from the Marquesas Islands, are being repatriated in the Spanish ship or Spanish warship, San Fulgoncio. Okay. Now, just in terms of homeward voyages, there was a pathway across the Andes not recommended for the faint-hearted. And if you're gonna do it, you do it in summer only. So the route was, if you were a mariner at Valparaiso, okay, which is just here adjoining um, Santiago de Chile, the, the city is um, on a, um, it's inland, and it's about 60 kilometers for, as the crow flies from Valparaiso to Santiago. Okay, so the route across the Andes, it would take typically 12 days just to get from uh, from the city here across to the um, Mendoza, which was on the Argentinian side. And that 12 days was through precarious, very precarious mountain, mountain passages that were very narrow in parts. It was very cold, even in summer, in the, in the night, it was cold. And it was really unpassable uh, during wintertime. Okay, so therefore, uh, formally, the route was only open from November to March. Uh, due to the elevation and snow. And we do know of one that made that route. And that was Captain Moody of the Whaler Tom. Okay, he crossed via this method in 1802. And he also, he records that he took his wife with him. And as best I can determine, his wife hadn't been on the ship on the way out. His wife was procured whilst he was in um, somewhere in South America. And she accompanied him to Mendoza and then from Mendoza across to Buenos Aires. Okay. 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 And then, of course, the last and the preferred way back was to sail back to the Atlantic. In other words, you would voyage around Cape Horn. Okay. So, for most mar mariners, this was the preferred route to get back to Europe. The problem, as I identify here, the problem here was that if you're an illegal, if you're an escaping convict, or you're somebody trying to escape your debts, then you, it's not an easy process because you, you know, Ship, you couldn't get a ship out of Sydney. You would have to perhaps be a stowaway. You would perhaps have to um, grease the palm of a master in order to hide you until you were clear. And then possibly on a basis of an understanding that, okay, well, I can't arrive in a port, an English port with you. So we'll have to land you somewhere before then. Okay, so in the, in the period of the European wars, so we're talking about 1796 until about what, 1815, Many prisoners um, that the Spanish had, who had been English, who were English, spoke of how few ships there were at Port Jackson that were available for them to get their passage home. You know, whether at, and let's face it, when you're talking to the Spanish, you weren't necessarily saying that you were an escaped convict. You were trying to dress it up as best you can could. Okay, uh, for if if this has tweaked uh, your interests. Uh, there are sources that would, may be helpful and organisations that can assist. I would thoroughly recommend, um, particularly if you've got a, if you're looking at whalers, then there's quite a good database um, under the whalinghistory.org. Um, this has been something that's been worked on by Australians, Brits and Kiwis, uh, named there. So A.G.E. Jones and Nicholson, 
Rhys Richards, Dale Chatwin, and it's presented, it's a database. So it's a very easy way to look at ships or ranges of ships between particular dates and so on that might be of use. Similarly, the Australian uh, Joint Copying Project, that link will take you to the research tools. Um, when I was starting out as a researcher, the Australian Joint Copying Project were microfilms, lots and lots of microfilms, and trying to understand the structure of where they fitted in order to find the records. Fortunately, the National Library, working with its other partner libraries, has digitized all that. So if you follow that link, that will get you to the, uh, it forms part of Trove now. So that will be the guides that can then get you into Trove that allow you to do research. Uh, to a less lesser extent, the Pacific Manuscripts Bureau, the last one there, that was a microfilming project conducted by Australia in order to look at old American logbooks um, that have been involved uh, from New, mainly from New England in the United States. And that's, a, that's quite a treasure trove of information, um, not quite so easily accessible as the AJCP materials noted above. Uh, then separately, if you're looking at materials on Latin America and want to get a better understanding of Latin America and its history and how things evolved there, then that link to the Library of Congress, the Handbook of Latin American Studies may be useful to you. Similarly, if you're looking for information in relation to the the Brits and their records, uh, there's two links there. The first one is the catalog of the National Archives. Uh, and they've done a lot of work there in uh, making material more accessible or at least descriptive in terms of finding things. And then the second link for the National Ar the British National Archives is uh, more their research guides to guide you. Uh, next reference, British Library. I found that quite invaluable at various times. The last two are Spanish. They're the Spanish sources that are, can be very good, particularly if you're prepared to arm yourself with Google Translate in order to sort of better understand the words. So that first one there will take you to the repository of all of the Spanish archives. And uh, there's perhaps now 35 million documents that have been digitized and they're available to you on that link. And separate to that, if you're looking at more the military side of things like the Spanish Armada, the naval records and so on, then that second link again will take you to digitize records of that particular uh, institution. And I found that invaluable over the years when I've gone looking for the English that landed in Spanish America. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That's It was a fantastic talk and I would oh, encourage- um, Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> And I would uh, thank you, Christine. And I would encourage our um, our audience to um, send an emoji or just put something in the chat, just letting Chris know that you how much you enjoyed the talk. And and so now we're going to move on to the comments, uh, comments and questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, I've I've already noticed that some are popping into the chat. Please um, continue, uh, and we'll come to those. Uh, if you want to ask a question directly to Chris, not using the chat. We require you to use the uh, raised hand feature in Zoom, just so we can know that, uh, that that way we can control who's unmuting when. And then you can, of course, ask a question um, if you do that. Okay. So, and I'm just, I'm just reading through the chat now and some of the questions that are being posed. So, um, so you happy for me to um, just yes, respond? If, okay. You're more than welcome to. Okay, so so Graham Neal, um, I'm reading your question here. So just to repeat it for everyone's benefit, uh, has your time in the Spanish archives enabled you to have an opinion on whether the British history that has come down to us is inaccurate with respect to Spanish influence or subject to sins of omission or both? That's a very good question. I would say there are lots of sins of omission. Okay, now I'll give you an example that goes to our very process of discovery. So when we think of James Cook, you know, James is, if I can use an example, within my own family, um, when I ask them, when was Australia discovered? They all say, oh, Captain Cook discovered it in 1770. And yet, if we think about it, Spain, sorry, not Spain, but um, the whole of Australia, let's call it two thirds, two thirds of the Australian coastline had been mapped and known by the Dutch 
by the uh, the middle of the 17th century, the 16, whatever. And I think I have here somewhere a map. If I just jump through here in a moment, yeah. Let me bear with me a moment whilst I. Okay, good. Okay, so if I minimize that, here is a chart of New Holland and Terra Australis, and it comes to us in 1644. Okay, so if we look at it, we have Tasmania. Abel Tasman charted this part. He also charted this part of the New Zealand coast. So that's the west coast of New Zealand. Um, coming, you know, there's the North Island, there's the South Island. Okay, the 1606, we have the very first landing on the coast of Australia with the uh, the Doifkin, the Doifkin in the Gulf of Carpentaria. So the English, I think, every, every empire tries to maintain its own myths. And the English myth was that the sun never sets on the British Empire. Well, that was actually the Spanish originally that came up with that terminology and the, um, and, uh, the British were certainly far more imperial in how they built their empire. The thing, uh, I don't have time to dwell on it, but here's something to think about. In 1783, at the conclusion of the American Wars of Independence, Britain was so shocked that it had lost its colonies, those 13 um, colonies in, the United, in what became the United States, that they did a fundamental change in their attitude about how to do colonies. And so the big part of that was that it couldn't all be a one-way um, engagement. It had to be one where there was give and take. And so therefore the British over the following periods, if you think about Ceylon, India, certainly the English speaking, you know, the major English speaking regions of Canada, you know, Northern North America, um, Australia, New Zealand, the islands of the Pacific, there was a fundamental difference about how the British engaged. And that's all as a result of the loss of those uh, 13 colonies on the um, east coast of uh, mainland North America. Um, so, but certainly part of that myth a lot mythologizing was that the Spanish were bloodthirsty exploiters of the Americas. And that was partly used by Britain to justify its invasion. So in 1806, it invaded um, uh, Buenos Aires. It wasn't a planned invasion. It was more like a, a Clayton's invasion. Um, yeah, I, I would say certainly by sins of omission, um, certainly what has come to us has been an Anglo-centric view um, where I've I got to say that the British were better administrators of colonies, but they weren't the be all and end all, and they were economic in their acknowledgement. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Okay, 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 Rob, my, my, okay, so I have a cousin in Mexico who is a Dr. Robert Jackson, uh, and I've got a comment, what have you written here? Cross Darien or down to Veracruz took people into areas with tropical diseases, yes. Yeah, yellow fever, malaria, did any die? Where in Veracruz were they held? Yep, uh, the the fortress at San Juan de, I can never pronounce it, Ulua, was where they were typically held. And I don't, I don't have records of who perished on the way across, but certainly the Spanish, uh, the English obliged the Spanish when there was a interlude called, as a result of the Treaty of Armin in about 1802, the British wrote to the Spanish and said, please, can you tell us of the people that you took prisoners, where are they and can you account for them? And the Spanish were quite diligent in seeking out and writing to each of the intendencias and uh, vice, the vice royalties. And the details are quite interesting. So uh, there's a book that I'm working on. It's a autobiography by a chap called James Choice. And it's fascinating because he tells the story of being a prisoner for several years in the Spanish Americas. And it's amazing how he, you know, he might get the first name wrong or the spelling of the last name, but he is able to detail how some of his compatriots died by various causes, not, not brutal causes, just accidents and misadventure in the Americas. Um, and those, those Spanish records uh, turn those up and demonstrate them. Um, okay, John Sanderson, links going to be available. Yes, they will be, I believe. Um, Philip, help me out here. Yeah, so uh, the two options we could, um, if you provide the links, I can do a 
a blind uh, a blind CC email to everyone who's booked. Otherwise, um, when the talk does go online, the links will be in the online recorded talk. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll provide those links and you can distribute to everyone that's attended the lecture. Yeah, happy to do that. Okay, um, let's see, Helen, uh, Helen Fletcher, have you been able to follow what happened to any of these people once they reached England? Yeah, I have with some. Um, so for instance, with Gardner, um, who was the master of the hero, um, through the Spanish record, it's possible to find him in Cadiz, uh, and the British consul there is basically doing his best to get him out of prison. Um, and then he turned, actually, he turns up in London having lost his ship and, um, and with the, uh, the uh, proceedings from the prize court. And that's basically forms the basis for um, uh, the ship or the owners of the ship going for their insurance claim. Similarly for George Bass, um, uh, there's a, it's quite interesting, court records in Britain can be very, very useful for turning up insights into what went on. Uh, they, in the past, they were very difficult to research because they weren't online. Uh, now, as a result of um, groups, um, a number of different academic publishers, like one, one in particular, Hain Online, that's H-E-I-N. Uh, if, you if you've got a student that's going to university or whatever, then typically, University libraries have that as an online database and you can turn up some amazing information. Um, it's a, a real gold mine. And that's also gonna be subject to a paper that I'm uh, trying to work on at the moment about um, the biographical information that can turn up as a result of court proceedings, both published and unpublished in the um, uh, British National, National Archives. Uh, Natalie, oh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, Jeff, thank you. Okay, uh, John, thank you. Okay. Uh, did I get this? Uh, great reminder not to think about Australian history in isolation. Yes, yes, I would say that. I, my, my comment would be that unfortunately, Australian history is usually written from the sources and the sources that we understand and they're typically in the English language and they're typically in a former, like a city that was once a colony like Sydney or back in the UK. The beauty of the UK situation is the public record, sorry, the British National Archives, TNA as it's now known, um, is a wonderful repository because it's all very centrally located. When you get into Spanish repositories, depending upon the era, depending upon who was in power, uh, there are a number of different sources. They've done a great job in making their information digitally available. And I think that will, in fact, it's a, it's a model for how to do things. And similarly, Trove is a great resource. Um, if you're interested in particularly uh, the Sydney Gazette, so 1803, the Sydney Gazette commences publication. Um, if you go um, ship news or ship intelligence, there's some fascinating stories that turn up there in terms of who was captured on the coast of Spanish America, who escaped, you know, or what's the ship intelligence as to who's still over there whaling or whatever. And, um, and for privateers, you'll often see them referred to as ship of war. Okay, I'm just coming down here. Uh, yep, agree. Yeah, Rob, totally agree. They are amazing repositories. Okay, Marcia, thank you. Uh, Annette, thank you. Um, anybody that's given me a compliment, I'll read it out. Uh, I won't read the compliment, I'll just say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Graham, okay, so Graham, you've asked any more information on the 1796 plan to invade Sydney. Uh, is there an internet site? No, I'm on, a, I'm on the hook to write a book. Well, I'm on the hook to finish an article for the uh, Australian Association of Maritime History Journal, which is called The Great Circle. Um, and then I might, after that, do a document note for the Mariner's Mirror. Uh, really, uh, if, if anybody knows a producer, I, I think the easiest way I'm going to get this out there is to get a doctor, documentary made where I'm a talking head, because I can talk, but I'm not as good, not, at good, not as good at writing. Um, I had an offer of what I like to do a book, and I'm still messing around with that. Um, I think that completes all the questions. Were there any others that I haven't addressed? No, I think you've pretty much covered them all. Um, 
I can't seem to find any, but I look, we have, um, are we past time? I'll give everyone maybe 30 seconds if there is one more question and then we might just close the, uh, the proceedings for today. Can I ask a silly question? I know, but um, when they got, when these people escaped on these um, Spanish boats, how did they get on with the language? Okay, so, um, uh, so in the case of the whalers, that's a good question. In the case of the whalers, uh, or if you're trading contraband, so if you're smuggling contraband, what you would do is you would often take on a local Spanish speaker and, and, and typically they give him a name like Don Jose. They're all using um, uh, non de plumes or uh, aliases. So your Don Jose would serve as your translator. Uh -huh. um, the, the guys, the British that served their time as prisoners of war in Peru and Chile, Many of them developed quite a good understanding of Spanish. And when they were repatriated um, to Britain or wherever uh, in the year 1802, um, they often proved invaluable as crew because they actually, particularly for smuggling vessels, because they had contacts and their level of Spanish was useful. <laughs> on, on the counter side, there are invariably people that were with, within the Spanish empire. There were approved uh, notaries who were the, trans, the translators and transcribers. So in, in the courts of Admiralty, the prize court, they would do their little translation bit. And actually just to that earlier question, hang on, I'm just out of thought. Um, okay, so here's a quick, a quick piece of useful, useless information. When Arthur Philip was given his um, instructions for running the colony in Sydney, here is the line that was used to delineate. This was New South Wales to the right, and to the left, it was not claimed by the British. And the reason for that is it was Dutch. And for those of you that know your history, the Dutch were actually originally a colony of Spain. So uh, until the Reformation, and you know, yeah, they, they went a separate part. So this line at 135, uh, where is it? 135 degrees east, okay, that was from the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494. Remember I said how the world was carved in half, mm. the Spanish had one side and the British had the other. Oh, sorry, the, not the British, the um, Portuguese had the other. Okay, so this line that effectively over the years eventually shifted across to be the line for Western Australia, the, the boundary for the state of Western Australia, as, as the na nature of the globe became more known, um, that actually has its origins to a treaty that was concluded between Spain and Portugal. Okay, so that bit of trivia. Hmm. Okay, and, and if I just go here, I'll get a bit, I've got a better image here. Okay, so this is an enlargement. Okay, so again, to Cook and the, um, the idea that Cook was the great discoverer. In 1767, Alexander Dalrymple, who had wanted to be the guy driving the um, transit of Venus and voyage of discovery. Okay, he wasn't a member of the Royal Navy. So the, um, when the Royal Society put it together, and requested it, the Royal Navy played it safe and gave it to Cook, which was probably a good play. But um, Dalrymple basically made this notation about earlier discoveries, okay? So he drew a map, here's New Holland as known from the Dutch, okay? And he speaks here, okay, and over here is Veracruz, which is Solomon Islands, I think, okay? And uh, Espiritu Santo. So Espiritu Santo was a discovery made by the Spanish. So what he did was he gave this to Banks. Now, to my mind, it would be very surprising that Banks didn't share this with Cook. But what it says is if we look here at this track, this is the track of Torres, okay? So Torres in 1606 sails up here, gets to the bottom of New Guinea, okay? And turns left and he sails below New Guinea. Now, Cook never acknowledged that he had information that allowed him to know that there was that the um, the land between Papua New Guinea and the New Holland mainland that there was actually a route through there. So he basically named it Endeavour Strait, okay, in in his journal. And what we find is that then when Dalrymple was the um, the hydrographer for the Royal Navy, in allocating names, um, what what Dalrymple did was he allocated the name Torres Strait to this because Torres was the first one to sail through. 
and as a bit of a compromise, he allocated Endeavour Strait to being that smaller piece of uh, a strait, which I think sits below Horn Island. We have a number of Torres Strait Islands up here. So Endeavour Strait becomes the smaller one. And, and it also leads to the question of um, Cook landed on an island called Proclamation Island and said, OK, I'm claiming this for the British, all, all that I've cruised along. And in a way, Cook had a pretty good idea that he, you know, he just needed to find an island around there because he knew that there was a safe way back to Batavia simply because of this uh, mud, mud map that had been created by Alexander Dalrymple. Mm -hmm. so, so, so to the earlier question about were the British economical with the truth, I think all British were reluctant to give um, credit where credit was due to the Spanish because it didn't suit their aspirations as an empire. And you know, why? You know, the, the Spanish, to be fair, I think the Spanish were not particularly effective at articulating because they had a, you have the, sorry, just to clarify, the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a game played by France and Britain, but the Spanish viewed the Enlightenment as just a game that was being played by these upstarts in order to get their hooks into their empire. And so therefore, the Spanish avoided anything to do with the Enlightenment except for a few um, exceptions. And so therefore the ability to proselytize and propagate, hey, this is what we've found and this is what we've done, didn't really happen. And, and in modern day, in this modern era, that's where Spain I think has suffered because when we go looking for materials, it's hidden, it's obscure. Whereas the British and the French were proclaiming it loudly and frequently. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That, that's that been a very enlightening talk. Very interesting, very fascinating, something different. Um, Christine, do you want to close off the proceedings for today? Yeah, well, I, I do. I, in a way, I'm really sorry that we're, we're finishing the session because it has been so interesting and there have been all those snippets of valuable information that are just just waiting to be um to, to win an argument with so but Chris it really is fantastic because you've done so much research and it's obvious that you've done so much and those the maps in particular I really do thank you for those it's wonderful being able to see them um even on a small laptop it's, it is great so thank you very very much um I'm very very grateful on behalf of the RAHS Thank you for your present presentation today. Great. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Have a good day.